Our, spe- our keynote speaker this morning is Alana Steinhain, Dr. Alana Steinhain. And um, she is someone who I'm especially excited to hear because she is someone who I've been an admirer of and a follower of for many years, um, even though it's my first time officially meeting her. But um, we're both members of the International Rabbinic Fellowship, which is a, was, I think, the first Orthodox Rabbinic Fellowship in America that includes uh, women. And she was the scholar in residence at Lincoln Square Synagogue in Manhattan, which is one of the most prominent um, Orthodox synagogues in the country. And that was also like a clergy type of role, which is also a first, one of the first for Orthodox synagogues in America. And um, at that time, she was voted as one of the 36 under 36 and achieved all kinds of accolades. And she became very well known and a very sought after speaker um, and, um, and doer on behalf of Kla Yisrael. She is currently the, um, for the Shalom Hartman Institute, their director of leadership education. And she is traveling around the country, leading and teaching and training people for the Shalom Hartman Institute. She has a doctorate in religion from Columbia University. And her doctorate is fascinating. It's, it's in legal loopholes. And it was done under the direction of Professor David Weiss Halivni. It's really fascinating work. She's also a graduate of Yeshiva University's graduate program in advanced Talmud study, and the Cardozo Interdisciplinary Fellowship in Jewish Law and Legal Theory. She has an incredible resume, and she really has a wonderful reputation, and we are quite honored to have her with us this morning, and we are all very excited to hear her. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lana Stein. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Okay, so this feels like a New York City subway where no one wants to sit quite next to each other, but you sort of like... Everybody gets their own half a row, amazing. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Board of Rabbis and all of the extended. Thank you, I think we have one of the rabbis of the synagogue here. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, What I wanna talk to you about today or what I wanna discuss together today is I actually wanna eventually get to the conversation about rights and obligations, but through the two strands that I find running throughout uh, the Pesach canon, if you will, whether it's the Haggadah, whether it's the way that Chazal, the way that the rabbis read Pesach or think about Pesach, whether it's the Chumash itself, and that's law and story. What we find constantly is this back and forth between the legal aspects of Pesach and the story, the narrative aspects of Pesach. And I want to deal with that on three uh, different levels. So just to project to you where we're actually going to be going. One level that I want to speak about it at is actually the level of how law and narrative uh, sensitizes us to the relationship between expectations and life. How it sensitizes us to what the rules should be or how life should go versus how it actually ends up going. That's one layer or one level that I want to deal with it. Um, Sort of the neatness versus the messiness. Uh, kind of perspective. Another way I want to think about it is in terms of what it means to commemorate an event through telling the story of the event versus what it means to commemorate the event through the particular symbols of that event in an obligation-focused kind of way and how that actually impacts collective memory and how that impacts the way that we think about how that story relates to our very lives today. And you'll understand more about what I'm trying to say as we get to it. And the third is I actually want to talk about whether law and narrative in some ways represent the different vectors of rights and obligations, or actually obligations and rights. Law being obligations, narrative being rights. And to discuss a little bit about what that um, means in terms of a conversation around the Seder table, and actually what that means in terms of Uh, living today when rights are so uh, emphasized and obligations are not as emphasized. Okay, so that's our map of where we're going. In order to start, what I'd like us to see is I'd actually like us to see one of the places where law and narrative seem to split. And that is actually in the way that Chazal describe what should be done at the Pesach Seder at night. The Mishnah versus the Tosefta. So the Mishnah and the Tosefta are always fun to look at together because the Tosefta, though it was edited a a, a, a generation rather after the Mishnah, has a lot of information that comes pre-Mishnah. So it's it's kind of hard to know 
is the Mishnah reacting to the Tosefta? Is the Tosefta including information that was rejected? Does the Mishnah know about the Tosefta? Is the stuff, in, is the material in the Tosefta in some ways more um, ancient than the material in the Mishnah? So when I see a Mishnah and a Tosefta that disagree about what a Seder night should look like, I actually take that very seriously. I don't take a Tosefta as though it's sort of on the outside. I take it very seriously as there's some sort of debate or conversation going on about what the essence of Seder night is, okay? So let's read a little bit together. I'm trying to figure out, given that we have about 75 minutes together, I'm trying to figure out if we should break for Chavruta to look over some of this. Can I get a show of hands from people if that's something they would want to do? We got three hands. Three people want to, so y'all can sit in the back and do your Chavruta, and the rest of us are going to continue. So let's just take a look at the Mishnah and Sachim versus the Tosefta and Sachim in number one. Okay? So obviously I've ellipsized and I've chosen which Mishnayot I want to look at. The Mishnah. Mazgulo kos sheni v'kan ha'ben sho'el. So it's time for Magid. Pour or actually mix the second cup and the child is going to ask. Im ein dat b'ven aviv melamdo. If the child doesn't know how to ask, the parent teaches. Ma nishtana halayl hazeh mikol halaylot. How different this night is from all other nights. Shebechol halaylot ein anu matbilim afilu pa'am achat. We don't usually dip even once. And tonight we dip twice. All of the evenings we eat both chametz and matzah. And tonight all matzah. All nights we can eat meat that might be roasted, that might be boiled, that might be cooked. But actually, everything is roasted because it's referring to actually the roasted korban pesach. According to the understanding or the intellect or not totally sure what they mean exactly by dot, but let's assume it's an ability to learn. The parent teaches. So you start with the negative, you end with the positive. And you do some nice expounding on the Arami Ovedavi passage, which itself is a narrative, until you finish everything. So the focus here is on Narrative or law? <clears throat> what do you say? So it's interesting. Why do you say it's on narrative, Neil? Um, well, it's a narrative because it's, there's this interplay between the child and the parent. And it, and it's... So you're saying the conversation itself yeah. is somewhat of a narrative? Yeah. How about the content of the conversation? The content of the... Yes, yeah, Sarah? Yeah, so it's actually interesting, the narrating the questions, I actually am I'm kind of fascinated by this, because you could have said this is actually about law, because you're talking about how many times you dip, and how, how many times you this, how many times you that, but the whole presentation is actually a presentation of what we're doing, what we're experiencing. It's not a presentation of these are the laws, of these are the halachot, so it's a presentation of this is what we're eating, this is how it's going for us, this is what we're experiencing, and then what you're going to tell the kid is not... You're not going to tell the kid, here's the law, you don't eat anything after Afi Komen, like you're going to tell the Chacham in the Haggadah itself, which we'll see in a minute. What you're going to tell the kid is, this was the bad stuff that happened at the beginning of the story, and this is the good stuff that happens at the end of the story. And in fact, we're actually going to use Arami Ovedavi, which itself is actually a story of saying, my father was a wandering Aramean, and this is what happened. Eventually, we got to this land, and we're not going to include even the getting to the land part. But the point is, it's all story, right? The focus is on experience. The focus is on story. And if you look in the next Mishnah, Ramagam Liel Omer, Kol Shelo Amar Shloshad Dvarim Elu Bepesach Lo Yatsai Dei Chovato. Rabbi Gamliel, I think, in some ways, is going to try to add a little bit of the halachic expression or the obligation expression in here, but still in kind of um, a story form. The Eluhain, here they are, Pesach, Matzah, Umerurim. Pesach, why do we eat the Korban Pesach? Because the Torah says, eat Korban Pesach, right? Isn't that what you would expect? No, play on words. Al Shum Shepesach, Amakom, Abatea, Abotena, Bimitzrayim. Because of the story, right? Mirorim, why do we eat maror? Not because al-matzot mirorim tochlu, not because the Torah actually says it, but because al-shem shemiru ha-mitzur metchayei avotenu v'mitzrayim, because of the story, because they made us bitter. Matzah al-shem shenig alu. That's it. 
בכל דור ודור חייב אדם לראות את עצמו כאילו הוא יצא ממצרים, and this is bringing the narrative into the present. לפיכך אנחנו חייבים, you want to know what obligation we have, our obligation is להודות, להלל, לשבח, לפאר, להדיר, לרמם, לגדל, לנצח, למי שעשה את כל הנשיאים, etc. ופציאנו יעדו את החברות, etc. The focus here is very squarely on narrative. Even when you actually bring in the elements of obligation, the obligation to eat the Pesach, the obligation to eat the Marot, the obligation to eat the Matzah, even when you bring in the fact that we're dipping, it's all done in this sort of story-like manner. That's not actually the way that the Tosefta describes what should be done on Seder night. And I think it's intriguing to see the difference. Let's take a look on the left-hand side of this. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Chotvin matzah latinokot bishvil shelo yishnu. So Rabbi Eliezer says, you got to give the kids matzah really fast, which is hilarious because there's nothing as food coma inducing as matzah. You want to keep them up here, quick, give them matzah. It's literally the opposite. But give them matzah so that they won't fall asleep, so that they'll be engaged. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, mishmo afilu lo achal ela parperet achat, afilu lo taval ela chazeret achat, chotvin matzah latinokot. Even if you really haven't gotten a chance to start the meal, just give the kids matzah quickly, right? You want to get them, you don't want them sitting there going, I'm leaving the table because I'm not getting any dinner, right? Now we want to know, until what part of Hallel do you recite? Beit Shammai Omrim Ad Eim HaBanim Smecha Ubeit Hillel Omrim Ad Chalamish Lomayno Mayim Vechotem Begeula and finish off with the bracha of Geula. So, I don't have here, the child is going to ask the parent, I don't, ha- I don't have that. I have, what's my obligation in terms of reciting Hallel? And here's our Machloket. And Amr Beit Shammai Ubeit Hillel, probably to Beit Hillel, how could you possibly go all the way to the parts of Hallel that indicate Yitziat Mitzrayim? They haven't left. Amrulahem Beit Hillel, Beit Hillel says, well, Afil humamtin an kriyat hagever harei elo yatsu ad sheish sha'ot bayom. Even if you wait until the morning, the people didn't actually leave Egypt, if you wanted to know exactly what time they left Egypt, right? They didn't actually leave Egypt until midday the next day. So even saying it in the middle of the night wouldn't actually do it. In other words, we're not actually imitating the story, right? Like, you hear what happens there? We're not on their timeline. Okay? How could you even mention it? So the first thing we get is, forget the questions, forget the conversation about what are we experiencing, what's my chiyuv, what's my obligation in terms of reciting halal, and make sure we realize that we're not actually imitating their timeline. So we're not doing a reenactment here. That's not what we're doing, Okay? And the next, it's actually two later, but Ein Maftir Nachar Pesach Apikomen, and here comes the famous story. After Apikomen, we're not going to be eating, or actually after the Pesach, we're not going to be eating Apikomen, meaning we're not going to be eating a dessert. Kigon Egozim, Tamarim, Klayot. Okay, don't eat nuts. Fine, okay? This, this would have been a good thing for doctors in the 90s to know. So the second line in, in that Tosefta marked chapter Yud, you should. You know what you do all night on Pesach? Talk about the obligations of Pesach, the laws of Pesach. Even with your child, who presumably doesn't know as much as you. Even by yourself, which I, a lot of New York, as a New Yorker, I do that a lot. Even with your student, meaning it doesn't have to be a conversation of equals, which is interesting, right? It's interesting in the sense that you might be teaching someone, but you might not be learning anything new, right? But the point is to be preoccupied in the obligations. And of course, here comes the famous story of the rabbis who stayed up all night and did what? Studied the laws, not told the story. Study the laws. Maseb Rabban Gamliel, Uzikanim, Shayu Mesubin Bebe Baitus Benzonin Bilud. There they are in Lud. Vahayu Asukin the Hilfot HaPesach, and they're busying themselves with the laws of Pesach. Kol Halayla Ad Krot Hagever all night until the rooster sounds in the morning. Higbiu Milifnehem, 
they took away the food from before them when it was the end of the night, essentially. And then they walked. You know where they went? They didn't do Kriyachma. They went to the Beit Midrash to learn some more. Ezu here birchat a Pesach, and they start having a conversation. What's the bracha on the korban Pesach? Baruch Hashem Kedushan Mitzvot Tavitz Venel Echol HaPesach. What's the bracha on the Zevach, meaning the other korbanot that are happening, like the korban Chagiga? Baruch Hashem Kedushan Mitzvot Tavitz Venel Echol HaZevach. What? I'm not going to ask what's behind the machloket here, of whether you're talking about law and story, or you're talking about law or you're talking about story. But I do want to use this as an opportunity to think about those two categories as distinct. The reason why I want to think about those two categories as distinct is, has anybody here participated in a protest recently? Has anybody here held a sign that says, because we were strangers, we must love the stranger, right? That's a great example of where story and law get intertwined, okay? I want to disentangle them for a minute. I want to disentangle them for more than a minute, but I want to disentangle them, okay? What does it mean to disentangle law and story? In that, as a detail within that, I want to ask the question as to Rabbi Gamliel, who shows up in our Mishnah being very participatory, experiential, eat the Pesach, Ashum she Pesach, right? And he shows up in the Tosefta, let's, let's learn the obligations, right? Let's learn the obligations. And not only that, but in our version in the Haggadah, we're staying up all night to tell the story. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Rabbi Gamliel's version of the Haggadah and our version of the Haggadah for a moment, okay? Rabbi Gamliel's um, greatest foe in the Talmud is? He, he actually makes a few... He makes a few enemies in the Talmud. What'd you say? What'd you say? Who? 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 I like that you want to say Rabbi Tarfon. That's not what I'm thinking about. What'd you say? Rabbi Yoshua. Why do you think Rabbi Yoshua? Meaning his argument, Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel's argument with Rabbi Yoshua on three key issues actually led to him embarrassing Rabbi Gamliel as the head of, he's the head of the rabbinic establishment, embarrassing Rabbi Yoshua on issues. And because of that, what happened because of that when he embarrassed Rabbi Yoshua when they disagreed? What was the result of that? He lost his job. Rabbi Gamliel lost his job, at least temporarily. Who got his job? Oh, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah got his job. Remember that Gemara where it's basically, Rabbi Gamaliel says to Rabbi Yeshua, stand up, tell everybody what you think. Did you actually say that people don't have to dive in Marib? He said, no, of course I said that people. Well, I heard that you said, and literally makes him stand on his feet the entire time, and everyone says, Rabbi Gamaliel, you are a despot. You're out of here. And they say, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, you're going to take over. And Rabbi Elazar ben Azari, you know, he has that whole conversation. I don't know. I don't have a beer. I don't look. I don't look the part. I can't do it. Right? Like before our first jobs, like that kind of thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't look the part. And then he comes in, and eventually they have a, a, a share situation where you have Rabbi Gamaliel gets three weeks, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari gets, gets one week. With that in mind, look at our version of up all night learning in number two in our Haggadah. Ma'aseh b'Rabbi Eliezer b'Rabbi Yehoshua b'Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria b'Rabbi Akiva b'Rabbi Tarfon. So you know who set up here? The opposition party to Rabbi Gamliel, right? Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria is there. Rabbi Yehoshua is there. And Shayu Masubim b'Bnei Brak. They're in Rabbi Akiva's town. Okay. Vayu Masaprim b'Yitziat Mitzrayim Koloto Halayla. And they're telling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Ad Shabot Talmidayim ba'amru lahen rabotinu giyazman kriyat shma shal shachari, time to die. Right? Or time to say shema in the morning. And right after that, Amar Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah says, Hare ani keven shivim shana v'lo zachiti shetayamer Yitzhak Mitzrayim v'alilot ad shadrasha ben Zohar. Here I am as 70 years old. This is the Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah who took over Rabbi Gamliel's job. That's, that's the Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah we're talking about. He says, I'm 70 years old. And I never, lo zachiti, I translate it as I never won the argument. <laughs> because I don't think it's just, 
It's a strange language. I never won the argument until Ben Zoma helped. And you might imagine I never won the argument until I had my spot running the rabbinic establishment. I never run, won the argument until Ben Zoma said, I'm not, the details of trying to figure out the days, including the nights, just in, in this world, even Olam Haba. But the point is, there's something going on here that's the, um, the opposition party in some way. And in our Haggadah, the opposition party wins. The reason why I care that it's the opposition party is not just to say that this is probably a Babylonian, this, this Sipur doesn't show up anywhere before the Haggadah. This is a Haggadah Sipur, that's it. It doesn't show up in a Tosefta, it doesn't show up in a Mishnah, it doesn't show up in a Talmud, it doesn't show up anywhere. It's not just to say that the provenance of this is probably Babylonian because it's engaging in this, but it's also to say that there may really be a distinction in how you're thinking about the night of Pesach, whether you view it through the lens of the laws or you view it through the lens of the story. And I know we do both, but again, I want to disentangle them for a minute. So a professor at, did we say Haifa University or University of Haifa? I don't know, but no one's here to correct it's me. It's a university in Haifa. It's a university in Haifa, very nice. Haifa U. So a professor, Sagit Moore, in, in Haifa University, she wrote a fantastic article, um, basically on the laws of sacrifice or the telling of the story of the Exodus. And she was writing about this. She's trying to figure out what, 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 what's the opposition? What's the issue? What, what, do you, what exactly are you arguing about here? And here's what she comes up with. Does anyone want to read number three? You can do Hebrew, you can do English, whatever makes you happy. Nobody? Come on. This is, this is what happens when you have a lot of rabbis together. The first thing that happens when you have a lot of rabbis together, and I'm allowed to say this, I'm married to one, I'm the daughter-in-law of one, my brother is one, my brother-in-law is one, I'm allowed to say this, okay? And I served in, as clergy in synagogues for eight years, I'm allowed to say this. When you get rabbis together, which is the same thing as when you get doctors together, and the same thing as when you get teachers together, it's the same. Everyone's like, I don't want to be the first one to speak. And I think one of the reasons is because nobody wants to hog the airtime. We don't think of any of you as hogs. Anybody can read. You can read first. We're not going to look at you as like, oh, of course she decided to read first because she's always trying to go first in everything. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay? Anybody, go for it. Three in English. Sagi Moore, please. In his discussion Thank you, Adam. Adam. Ravan Gamliel relates to the concrete redemption from the Jew, only rather than mentioning the continuation of the redemption for generations, meaning that he does not speak of the redemption of our ancestors, of us and of our children. Ravan Gamliel thus pushes away the immediate experience of enslavement and of a call to redemption, and instead emphasizes the experience of the past, the far off and the nearby together. Ravan Gamliel and the leaders sitting with him, however, deny, it seems, the major change in reality, in this case, the loss of the Paschal Lamb. They do, however, try to create a sense of continuity through learning about the sacrifice, but without encouraging any immediate sense of redemption which may cause people to take concrete initiative to bring the redemption. Okay, she's saying a lot. She's saying a lot. One thing that she's saying is the focus on the law as opposed to the story looks at this as a historical moment. It's something that happened. It's something that took place. Whereas, she's suggesting between the lines, looking through the lens of story makes it more cyclical, which is meaning that history is cyclical. Right, but why not eternal? Right? Makes it more eternal. E e e equally good. The reason why I think the piece that she adds at the end, that Rabbi Gamliel is not interested in them trying to create a new exodus in the historical moment that they're actually in, right? Which is like a Roman historical moment, essentially. Right? Who knows? Right? This is all this is all surmising. But the point that she makes in a way is probably the reason why a lot of us like to focus on the story at the Seder as opposed to necessarily obligations or law, is because the obligations and the law point backwards in a certain way. The story points to the 
continuing human story and universal experience that people experience all the time, that you have redemption and that you have enslavement or persecution and then redemption and persecution and then redemption, right? It's something that brings it into the current moment in a certain way, right? So the narrative, is that what you're it brings, it brings the, the ah, narrative brings it into the, into the current moment, yeah. exactly. And what she says about the way that, um, or what she suggests about the way that the Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah camp, which is the way she actually refers to the people in our Haggadah, is that they're actually trying to make it something that people are experiencing right now. And there's a political reason for that. So let's look at number four for a moment. To the second approach, there are consequences in two central arenas. The first is ideational. The story of the rabbis in Bnei Brak, which connects the current moment to parallel, that should be, processes in Jewish history, changes practically the perspective of the people present. The destruction and exile are not a singular experience, but instead one experience among the many difficulties that the Jewish nation has survived during its existence. The other area is in the personal. The approach of storytelling by this group in Bnei Brak sees in the experiential rather than the intellectual the way to properly deal with loss. Right? So what she does is two things here. One is she basically says, let's bring this, think about it, it's Rabbi Akiva, it's perhaps a more um, activist kind of perspective that basically says, when you bring story, what you allow people to do is you allow them to connect to the possibility of this story happening again right now, right? In a way in which law is not able to do that. Question. Story seems very compelling. It seems very compelling. So is there something compelling about the legal way of doing it? Is there something compelling about Rabbi Gamaliel's way? She's trying to make Rabbi Akiva's way look compelling and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's way look compelling. Is there something compelling about Rabbi Akiva, about Rabbi Gamaliel's way? of doing it through the law, of doing it through the obligation. Yeah, let's hear it. So you, what you might suggest is while story might feel eternal, you're suggesting that perhaps some of the concrete actions associated is what actually keeps this going in an eternal, in an eternal way. Interesting. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, well, we usually think about, as she said, the, the story possibly uh, catalyzing Temporary feeling of a redemption course within people. Mm -hmm. um, but the other argument is, is that there's redemption in keeping the law. You know, that, that the law itself is, is, is a concrete way of redeeming the people. That and there's some way, there's some way in which that's, and we're going to get to that when we talk about obligations and rights, there's some way in which the law is the story is what you're trying to say, or I think what I'm hearing you say. There's some way in which the law is the story, yeah. My intrigue about the question of law from these rabbis' perspective is that, relatively speaking, the law itself, what they're doing is fairly new. I mean, by now, we look at it and say it's been thousands of years we've been doing it this way, but for these people, it wasn't that long ago that the law was different. This wasn't the, you didn't argue about this particular observance. You did it in a Beit HaMikdash, you did it with sacrificing and you did all kinds of different things. This is a law that they themselves have created. So the eternal question is Well, so this, so it, this is really fascinating in terms of what you said before. I don't know your name yet. Susan, what Susan said before in terms of the eternal question or what's considered relevant. When they're thinking about the loss of a Beit HaMikdash and they're thinking that they're not going to be able to have that same experience and they literally have lost that sense of narrative with this because they no longer have it, what you're really saying is that what picks them up and what's totally new and fresh for them in a certain sense is the ability to do this through law, right? That actually takes the place in certain senses of, of narrative, right? Like Aramio Veda V was actually supposed to be said when you are um, standing at the Beit HaMikdash and you're going to get... So using Aramio Veda V on Seder night, while it may have been familiar to people, it actually is kind of a reminder of loss 
more than it's right. Meaning to be able to actually use that, and of course, the end of Aram Yomim where you actually come to the land of Israel is missing because that's not what's happening in the exile, right? That's not actually what's going to be able to happen. So in order to be able to take on a narrative, you need to be able to take on a narrative that you can actually fulfill and you can actually feel like a part of. And you're saying actually the law is the place where they can actually feel like a part of things, right? Not in a selfish kind of way, but actually in a self-actualizing kind of way. I right? think you've given my words far more than I thought. That, that works, <laughs> that works. But there's one thing, there's one thing that I do wonder about which is using the paradigm of Yitziat Mitzrayim as the paradigm which has been used throughout, the, throughout history, using the paradigm of Yitziat Mitzrayim for all successive redemptive situations. And that is what happens, and this relates to Adam's point, what happens when it's not the right model, when it's actually not the right lens through which to view things. And I'll explain to you. Let's look literally to the end of this source sheet for a minute, to Dr. Brachi Eli Tzur, who I highly recommend. Um, you can find some of her stuff online. So Dr. Eli Tzur points out that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and especially in the book of Chronicles, the Exodus is almost completely absent, even where we would expect to find mention of it. The omission of the Exodus from the text in Divrei Hayamim has been interpreted in various ways. In light of our above discussion, you have to go there to see her above discussion, we view it as arising from the sensitive state of the returnees from the Babylonian exile and the desire to instill some hope in them with regards to the future. The Exodus was a one-time event, a miracle of unprecedented scope, in which a subservient nation received divine aid that transformed its situation from one of persecution to one of triumph. Recognition of God was the main purpose of the miracles of the Exodus, and God's hand was felt at every stage of the process. The miraculous aspect of characterizing the Exodus could have amplified the sense of weakness and lack of faith among the returnees toward the promises of the prophets. The miracles of the return to Zion were not spectacular, unprecedented wonders. The reality was very different from the prophetic descriptions of events whose power would cause the impressions of the miraculous Exodus to fade into oblivion. The omission of any mention of the Exodus then was meant to moderate the anticipation of a supernatural miracle and to reinforce faith in the process of the return as the realization of God's promise via the prophets and as the realization of redemption. In other words, sometimes the story doesn't fit. And the fact that the story doesn't fit actually causes a great deal of cognitive dissonance among people. And the question of what kind of what kind of continuity can we actually create and what kind of baseline stability can we actually create actually could be the response of the rituals, right? Meaning the rituals, the laws, the obligations, which is to say this is something that no matter what your experience is right now, whether it feels like a exodus redemption or it feels like kind of a disappointing redemption as the return, the return to the second base, I mean, <coughs> Dach did for many people, as reported in Ezra, or it feels like this is not a time of redemption at all, being able to look back at your history and be able, being able to have the laws that remind us or the rituals that remind us of our history, that actually keeps it open in a different kind of way and doesn't open this sort of messianic expectation that we're looking for. So that's the first thing I want to say after 30 minutes. That's the first thing I want to say about law and story. That whereas story creates an immediacy and an ability to try to recreate something and a, a paradigm that people seek to use in a big, loud, audacious way that feels relevant and, and, and um, it feels relevant and it feels compelling, the question of what actually provides the sense of continuity in moments in which that audacious narrative is not possible or cannot happen is law, ritual, fill in what you'd like. All of us sitting here have different understandings of what obligation means in Judaism and what law means in Judaism. So fill in how you would, but the, the, the non-story and moving into actually either the ritual moments or the obligation moments or the law moments is actually a way to keep it, it's a way to keep it moving when the story actually is not compelling in that moment 
or even if the story is compelling in that moment, it's a way to keep it in. They temper each other in interesting ways. Yes? Do you comment on um, Elijah's compromise? I, yeah, I, I think it's really... I think it's really interesting, the question of at what point, like if you, if you see the Haggadah, at what point different pieces were added. And I also would suggest that very, very early on, the Haggadah actually goes very much in the Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariya, Rabbi Yoshua route. Very much goes that route. Recall, Halach Ma'anya. Halach Ma'anya ends with, next year will be B'nai Chorin in Israel. That's a pretty early text in the Haggadah. We end with Lashana Abab Yerushalayim. We have Elijah's cup. There is a lot in, we do end with, you know, Ashur Ga'al et Avotinu and will Huyig Alotanu, right? We do end with that. I think that the Haggadah has a very, very story impulse to it. Very. That's why it's called the Haggadah, right? It has a story impulse to it. I actually, not surprisingly, Phil won't be surprised by this because this is this is always the way that I think. If there's something that is that is taking up all the space, I want to challenge where the other piece is. So I want to know. It doesn't have to be in the Haggadah. It can be anywhere in the story. I want to know where obligation fits in. I want to know where ritual fits in. I want to know where law fits in. That's I, I'm looking for the other side because I think that impulse unchecked. It don't work. We, we've seen it. That impulse unchecked does not work, right? So that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do here. Thank you for bringing that up. Other ideas, other thoughts, other questions? Could yes? Could you do more with that impulse unchecked? I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do yet. Let's do it now. Okay. Let's do it now, okay? Let's, meaning, let's, let's go to the second piece. Okay. Here's the second piece, okay? And, and I, just wanna, I just wanna point out to us for just a minute that there's like this facile way in which people look at law versus story. And I think in some ways it comes up in the Haggadah. It's not meant to be facile, but it becomes that. That if you notice the text of the four children, who are the smart ones? The Chacham and the Rasha are the smart ones, right? What are they engaged in? What are they talking about? They're talking about law, right? Who are the not as smart ones? The one who can't ask, the one who's simple. What are they engaged in? Story, okay? What I'd like to get away from is this, the smart ones engage in law and the not so smart ones engage in story, okay? Even though, by the way, I think it might be a reflection of what we just said, which is there's a sophistication or a nuance to being able to say, well, I can't actually map this story directly on to, uh, I can't actually map this story directly onto my present right now. I need to do something else that sort of inspires it and I have to figure out exactly how it fits. But I don't want to be simplistic and say, oh, the law is for the smarty pants and the story is for the dummies. That's, God forbid, right? That's not, that's not what I would want to do. But the second piece, if the first piece in some way is the question of how you actually keep continuity and how you actually uh, relate something that happened in the past to what's going on in the present, the second piece about law and story is something about neatness and messiness. Oh, Rabbi Sarah Ronsky, it's so good to see you. The, the, it is about neatness and messiness. Because something that happens in the Pesach story is that somehow law and story go together very, very neatly. There are very few times, actually even in the Bible, there are very few times where what you expect to happen is what happens, right? You expect the firstborn to get the bracha, that doesn't happen over and over again, right? You expect the people to get to Israel, that doesn't happen. You expect Moshe to get to go into Israel, that doesn't happen. So if we look in some way, and Robert Cover, who I don't, I never remember if he was a professor at Harvard or Yale, it doesn't matter. Once you're there, you're there. Yale. Once, once you're at that level, you're at that level. But Yale, so Robert Cover, law professor at Yale, actually sensitized me to this fact, not personally, I wish, but sensitized me to this fact of law being actually representative of like what are rules in the world, like what's assumed that's going to actually happen in the world that that's kind of a stand-in for what's supposed to happen or what's supposed to be, and story as the messiness of what actually takes place. So when I think about that in terms of the Pesach Seder, forget the Pesach Seder, look right in the Chumash. This is one of my favorite things. Why do we eat matz on Pesach, according to the Torah? Because our ancestors Because they ate it, right? Because of the story, because they ate it. So here, this is wild. Let's look at Shemot Yudbet for a second. 
Shemot Yud Bet in number six tells us Shivat Yamim Matzot Tochelu eat matzah for seven days. Ach Bayom Rishon Tashbitu Sormi Batechem and get rid of the leaven from your house on the first day, which we find out from Chazal means on Erev Pesach. Ki Chol Chel Chametz Venechotan Nefesh Ahimi Yisrael Miyom Rishon Adi Yomashvi because if you eat chametz, bad news. Okay, so that's why we eat matzah because Shemot Yud Bet Pasuk Tedvav says eat matzah. Or maybe later in the parak, in Pasuk Kaftet, Vayihi v'chatzi alayla, it was at midnight, v'hashem hika kol b'chor be'eretz mitzrayim, v'chor paro ha'yoshev al-kiso, v'chor ha'shev asher v'vei tabor, v'chol b'chor behima. And there's makat b'chorot, and of course, Paro says, okay, I want you to get out of here. And here comes Pasuk Lamed Gimel on the next page. So we just have to hear the page turn. You know, as rabbis, like you need to hear that page turn. It's like a, it's like a, it's like, it's like clocking in or something. Pasuk Lamed Gimel vatechezak mitzrayim al ha'am lemaher l'shalcham in ha'aretz ki amru kulanu meitin. They said, get out of here and hurry up. Vayisa ha'amet b'tzeko. So they had to take their dough terem yachmatz before it could become chametz mishaarotam tsurot b'simlotam al shechmam. And there they are. They have all their satchels uh, on themselves. That's why we eat matzah. So we eat matzah because the beginning of the parak God says, eat matzah? Or we eat matzah because the story happened that they couldn't do? There's something that happens in Yitziat Mitzrayim that is this perfect overlap. Right? You, by the way, you see it again with the man. You see it again with the manna in the, in the, uh, in Bamibar. They try to create, God tries to create the exact same experience of don't go out and collect because there's not going to be anything there to collect, right? The law and actually the world, they, they work together. The neatness and the messiness. There is no messiness. There is no messiness. God said eat matzah, and that's exactly the way that it's going to work out, right? That is not the way the world usually works. It's just not. And there's something very meaningful, and this is actually, I think, what Rabbi Gamaliel is actually trying to do with the Pesach matzah and maror. There's something very meaningful about, oh, the ritual actually comports with what happens in the world. They're not actually uncomfortably unrelated. They're very comfortably related. This is a very big topic in life. You're rabbis. People have been told to behave a certain way or have made commitments to behave a certain way and then they find themselves in a situation where they say, my guiding principles don't work here. I don't know what to do. Life is too messy for this. Or they actually use their guiding principles and those guiding principles get them into a bad situation or get them into a bad situation where they say, this is not, this is what it was supposed to look like in real life. This is what this is. I'm confused by what this is. So the relationship between law and story in some way is a relationship between expectations or what we're told to believe or assume and what actually happens. And on Pesach, there's actually a, an overlap. But that doesn't mean the overlap is going to last at all. At all, at all, at all. In fact, the example of the Rasha in the Haggadah, I think, is the example where that relationship is not overlapping. It's supposed to be hunky-dory, everybody goes out, everybody did. And then suddenly there's a pee under the mattress. And we're going to talk about that pee under the mattress in, in a minute. We're going to talk about that pee under the mattress. But for the moment, I actually want to show you a place within Chazal's discussion where they recognize that even in the way that we do Pesach, once you leave that moment of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, that idea of the law and the story, actually the expectations or the rules or the guiding principles and actually the way life works is going to get uncomfortable again. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Gemara in Psachim when learning about Pesach. Has anybody here learned the parak in uh, Psachim, Arbe Psachim? You don't want to brag? Is that the issue? You don't want to brag. Okay, fine. You're a bunch of rabbis, you don't want to brag. Okay, you all learned it, we got it. Okay, fine. The, the, I, I don't know where this was hiding my whole life when I learned Arbe Psachim, but look at this in number eight. And this is going to lead us right into rights and obligations. Working off of the injunction to be matzchil bignut u'mesayim b'shevach, 
starting with the negative, moving to the positive. Here we go. My big nut. What is the negative? Rav Amar Mitzchila Ovde Avodah Zara Hayu Rav says the negative is that we used to be idolaters, which, by the way, to my mind, might have a law kind of connotation as well, trying to go in that direction. Ushmul Amar Avadim Hayinu. Shmuel says, let's talk story. That's that itself, you can, when you start looking for law versus story and you start looking in Pesach, you're going to see it everywhere. The question is, what kind of meaning are you going to make of it? And that's the, the kind of meaning that we're trying to make right now. Amar le Rav Nachman ladaru avde. Here we go. We are at the Seder. Rav Nachman says to his servant, Daru, who is an Eved, right? He's an Eved, Knani. He says, avde de mafik le mare lecherut. If an Eved's uh, master sends them free and gives them silver and gold. My my what, what what would that Evid have to say? He said he would have to say thank you and he would have to give praise. Amarle, great. What do you think is gonna happen at the end of the story? It's Seder night, we're talking about liberation. Seder night, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to let him go, right? He's going to let him go. And by the way, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me that the Torah says you have to keep an Evid Knani forever because we have examples in the Gemara where the rabbis figured out ways to, we need this guy for a minion, so we're going to open it up and we're going to let him out. He could have figured out a way to let him out. He totally could have figured out a way to let him out. I'm not, I'm not blaming this on the Torah saying you have to keep an Evid Knani. I'm not blaming the Torah. I'm not blaming the Torah. Rav Nachman's trying to figure out, you know, how do I do this best? And Daru tells him, and then he says, Great, we don't have to say Manishtana anymore. And he started and he said, we were slaves. Oh my gosh, that just happened. Right? Why is that in the Gemara? You think the rabbit, the rabbit, they're so smart, they're so smart. This is why it's in the Gemara. It's trying to tell us that this is what happens in real life, right? Meaning real life is not as easy as this. So, okay, we're going to have liberation. And it doesn't, I don't know if Chazal are thinking it's not as easy because we have lolam behem ta'avodu. We have this Pasuk that says that you keep your Evet Kanani and you don't just let your Evet Kanani go, right? I don't know if it's not as simple because he needs Daru and they have a great relationship or Daru needs to be there because he, he, you know, stole something and he's totally, I don't know if it's because he doesn't realize, he doesn't even know, he doesn't even realize that he's thinking about his own, I was freed and he's not thinking about Daru. I don't know, but it's clearly in here, as I might argue, um, as one of my mentors, one of my academic mentors suggests, Barry Wimfimer, like, mostly every example of Talmudic narrative that revolves around law that upends what you would have thought would have happened is therefore, which is to tell you that life is messy. That life is messy. That what you expect is not always what you get. And this goes back to exactly to your question, Neil, which is <clears throat> the story of the Exodus is such a story of you, ex- you get what you expect. It's such a story of you will triumph and you will overcome and everything will be great. It's such an aspirational story. The question of what has to be in place for that actually to happen, wow. And in some ways, that's the role of law. But you can't have law without story. You can't have law without realizing that the real truth is messy and the way things work. We can't pretend that everything is just... Yeah, yeah, I eat my Pesach, I eat my Matzah, I eat my Mara, everything is good when there are, you know, pogroms outside my house, right? You can't pretend that. Or when there are other people who are suffering. I can't pretend that. But the question is how do law and story mediate one another? Story sort of pushing to the activist impulse of like pushing forward and embracing that messiness and law reminding you that you need some guidelines for that messiness, because it, it's not all necessarily going to work out exactly the way you want it. So in some ways, the way that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Gamliel, I, I mean, the way that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Elazar and Azar, Azaria and Rabbi Oshua in some ways are looking at story, at least the way Professor Moore looks through it, is that they're looking at story as something that enables. And they're looking at law as something that commemorates but, but keeps you at bay. In some sense, looking at this as story as the messy piece, right, 
not necessarily the successful piece, the actual messy piece, to be able to be prepared for a mess, not for enabling and empowering, but to be prepared for a mess and to also be able to retreat to your non-messy uh, uh, simplicity, but also, also to recognize that they actually are in conversation. Does that help a little bit? Okay, you'll see. So far so okay? You know, rabbis, we, we need feedback. I need feedback. I need like a smile or something. Yes. What's your name? Uh, Thanks for having, having us, Nolan. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Could it be that the story about the rabbis that they brought, that, that ultimately that's what's best, that embodies the messiness? Like, Rabbi Gamaliel is not messy. He's the leader we're supposed to have. He's the descendant of King David in all ways. Right. The opposition party is by definition messy. Right. So these are a bunch of sloppy guys, the five of them, right, who aren't supposed to be the leaders of Israel. Rabbi Kimo is supposed to be a shepherd. Elzer, right, Rabbi Gamaliel is storied, he's the patriarchate, he's an exile arc, he's all those arcs. Right. I mean, <laughs> the story is literally quoting the Sukya. He's like 70 years old. Mm-hmm. That's what he, when he prays to God, right. God makes him to look like he's 70 years old. Mm-hmm. We don't know if he actually aged or he didn't age, but he changed his appearance. So when he tells the stories, God intervened on behalf of essentially... Somebody not from the Davidic line, not Moses. This was a this was somebody from this was an extra that was picked off of the set to become the leader of Israel. And he's the one that talks about Mashiach, not Rabbi Gamliel, who is in line to be the Mashiach. But wait, so slow down, slow down, because you said a lot, a lot, a lot of good things, but a lot of things, right? So slow down for a second, which is there's something about the neatness. There's something about the neatness of the halachic way of doing things that's very neat. Right? Meaning it's not, you know, tell the story and see what people have to add. And it's, it's neat. But to be honest, it's not that neat either. Right? Meaning you're going to go back and forth. When does this apply? When does that not apply? Right? That's, it's not that neat either. So it's a little bit of a, a, a stereotype, but it's kind of emphases. And what you're suggesting is that the focus on the story is like a focus on um, moments of like supernatural abilities where we sort of move beyond the expected. Right? So it's not messiness in a bad way, it's messiness in a good way. Right? It's, that's actually what Robert Carver says about the whole book of Breshit. He says, the book of Breshit is actually reminding you that if you have real divine destiny, sometimes it means expecting the unexpected. Right? That's uh, what he suggests. But when expecting the unexpected is the only thing you have, then you're in a little bit of trouble. And I think the question of what pieces came in where in the Haggadah, I think is tough to say. The two things I would just push back on one is I would just say that I wouldn't consider Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva certainly not a hoi polloi. Rabbi Tarifon certainly not a hoi polloi. Rabbi Yeshua is certainly not a hoi polloi. Meaning these guys are not, they're the opposition party, but they're, they're not, um, they're not uh, any lower in stature. They just come from maybe a different mindset. So I think the point that you're bringing, there's a, there is a democratization, and I think that's an interesting point, that there is a democratization, and I think that's very relevant. Um, to the I'm trying to store. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you brought it up. I want to go to the third piece, right? So I'm just reminding us of where we've been because it's very iterative and the way that you choose to use this or don't choose to use this or how this informs the way that you do your Seder or anything, that's obviously up to you. But just to, just to say what I tried to come here to say is noticing the two strands of law and story and actually being able, and again, fill in for law, ritual, obligation, however you see that branch, and story fill in as narrative, experiential, um, uh, almost like tangible in a way, that one impact of the difference between law and story is the question of what actually provides continuity. And when do you need one because it's an action moment, let's say, and when do you need the other because it's a keeping you it's keeping you in the conversation moment. And even when it's an action moment, when do you need law to remind us that the story is not an exact map on to what we see? So that's one. Two, kind of the reverse, which is to say that we have in Pesach a moment where the law and the story or the expectations or the rules and what actually happens perfectly map on to each other. And that's something that should be very inspiring and should be very special. And actually looking at Pesach, Matzah, and Mar as moments that are not only 
legal or obligational or ritual pieces, but actually represent a reality that people experienced in kind of a very tangible uh, way is something that's powerful, but it's powerful only when we're able to admit or only because we're able to admit that life doesn't usually work that way. That oftentimes the ironies of life include the guidelines or the principles not actually applying when you actually look to the outside world or even the way that we ourselves do things. The third, and these are all actually related to one another, so I'm picking them apart just for the purpose of emphasis, the third is the relationship between obligation and rights. Because when I think about, um, when I think about law or ritual or obligation, what I think about that, what I think about there is that um, we're being we're being asked to do something or told to do something. Okay, we're being told to do something. When I think about the story of talking about our redemption, to me that reflects a celebration of our rights, our right to freedom, our ability to come out to, to come out of this terrible experience, and we celebrate a lot of people's rights at the Seder, not just our own rights. But what I'm wondering is, we live in a world that is uh, full of conversations about rights, not as full of conversation about obligation, okay? And for some people, this obligation is gonna be a lot of obligation, for some people, this obligation is gonna be moral obligation, for some people, this obligation is gonna be social obligation, political obligation, et cetera, et cetera, right? Again, I'm not trying to presume that the way that I think about it is the way that you think about it. These are big categories of obligation and rights. And I wanna think for a moment of what role obligation and rights play in the conversation about Pesach. So if you look at Robert Cover, who I've been quoting the whole time in number 10, one, one point that he makes just in general um, about Judaism is that Judaism's focus is on obligation rather than rights. Judaism is itself a legal culture of great antiquity. When I'm asked to reflect upon Judaism and human rights, therefore, the first thought that comes to mind is that the categories are wrong. I do not mean, of course, that basic ideas of human dignity and worth are not powerfully expressed in the Jewish legal and literary traditions. Rather, I mean that because it is a legal tradition, Judaism has its own categories for expressing through law the worth and dignity of each human being. And the categories are not closely analogous to human rights. The principal word in Jewish law, which occupies a place equivalent in evocative force to the American legal systems, uh, rights is the word mitzvah, obligation, which literally means commandment, but has the general meaning closer to incumbent obligation. This is a really important point. Think about the Aseret Hadibrot for a minute. The Aseret Hadibrot don't say every person have a, has a right to life. The Aseret Hadibrot says lo tirzach. You have an obligation not to kill someone, right? The Aseret Hadibrot doesn't say your parents have a right to honor or reverence. It says you have to honor and revere them. This sort of change in orientation, or I would say balance for the kind of uh, world that we live in, I think is really important and has something to say. And again, no matter how we interpret what the obligations actually uh, do, when I thought about this question of obligations and rights, I said to myself, you know, and, and maybe we can think together also. I have some things to say, but maybe we can think together. What does it mean to be an obligation-based society what does it mean to be a rights-based society? Some differences. So like one, one thing I think about, and, and, and I hope people will add more. One thing I think about is a rights-based society starts from here, right? Meaning it's what are my rights before I get to anybody else? What are my rights? Starts from inside. An obligation-based society connects me to someone, something else, by definition. Right? That's an obligation-based society. So Syrian refugees have rights. Do I have an obligation to those rights? So if I'm in an obligation mode, I'm thinking about my obligation. If I'm in a rights mode, I could care about those rights, I cannot care about those rights. Right? You have them, it doesn't, what, 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 what commands does that have on me? It doesn't really place necessarily a demand on me. So that's, that's the first thing uh, that I think about. The second thing that I think about is, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a human being? Is like the sine qua non of being a human being having rights, or is the sine qua non of being a human being having obligations? It's a big question. What does it mean to be human? 
What does it mean to be human? And that's a question, I think, that's, that's being asked in some way whenever we try to figure out whether we're focused on obligations or we're focused on story of freedom, right? And remember at the beginning I said we entangle these things. I was a slave in Egypt and therefore... So I'm going to slow down on that for a minute. Because I was a slave in Egypt and therefore I have to do X. You know who the focus is still on? Me. What if I wasn't the slave in Egypt? Do I still have to do X? I'll put it a different way. Let's, the Elora Azaria case in Israel, right? So a, a Mechabel, a terrorist, is down, you know, in, his, in a pool of blood. What, what rights does that guy have? What rights does that, does that guy have? That's for judges to decide. I don't know what rights that guy has, but I know what my obligations are, right? Interesting, right? It, it, there's a difference. There's actually a difference when you think about rights versus obligations. And now I'm going to try to do something that people might hate so much. But you also might not. You might say, oh my gosh, this opens everything. I can't believe it. Let's talk about the Russia for a second. Hmm? It's everybody's least favorite part of the... Not everybody's favorite. People who are very authoritarian, it's like their favorite part of the, part of the Haggadah, right? So I have done so much research on the Russia. I've tried so hard. I'm like, oh... Hakechi na blunt his teeth. This comes from when you look at the later prophets. There's this whole conversation about avodah uh, luboser v'shinei tikena, where they're trying to say, oh, Jewish people in the time of the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash, you're suggesting that it's your parents' fault and it's not your fault. And the the basically the um, neviim say, what you think the parents ate unripe grapes and the kids came out with blunted teeth? So blunting the kids' teeth is a way of saying you be responsible for yourself. Uh, okay, I tried. I tried. Rights and obligations. You ready for rights and obligations? Again, you have to take obligations as like a big abstract category so that no matter how you think about obligations in Judaism, it, this, this does something. If obligations are outward focused and rights are inward focused and obligations connect me to somebody and rights don't have to, let's look at the Russia in number five. Russia ma hu omer. What does the Russia say? Ma avoda hazot lachem. What is this work that you're doing? What is this obligation that you are performing? Lachem for you, Valola, not himself. Ulafi showed siat atzmom in haklal kafar veikar because he took himself out of the general group. This person has denied the essence. The afataha catch, you know, then you should blunt this person's teeth. What does it mean to blunt someone's teeth? I don't know. Use a nail file. I don't know. And you say, God did this for me when I left Egypt. Leave a low, not for you. Had he been there, he wouldn't have been redeemed. I'm going to try something and then attack it and be like, that's ridiculous. And maybe we don't need the Russia in order to do this. But if an element of Yitziat Mitzrayim is not just about rights, but is about obligation. And obligation is many things. Obligation is obligation to God. Obligation is obligation to the community. Obligation is obligation to the stranger. There's a lot of obligation in here, right? And the Rasha doesn't understand obligation. All he understands is rights, which is, I got this. What do I have to do? What do I have to do something? Well, then you miss the whole point. The whole point is that there's obligation here, and that actually matters. I think that might be a different way to read it. Anybody have anything to add on rights and obligations? You're all very smart people, so you should feel free. Or what you might be struggling with in this in this conversation? Yes, Alana. I'm struggling with From one to another. Idea that rights are in work focused and obligation is outward focused in the sense that if someone else has rights, then I have an obligation not to trample on their rights. Great. You might have a, a, an obligation to respect their rights. Is that an active obligation or is that a negative or a positive? Meaning, is that an active obligation to go help them or is that you can't trample on something? Well, I mean, I would think it depends depending on what situation. Mm -hmm. if, if all they need from, from me is to stay away from, you know, not do them harm, then fine. But it seems like they are connected, like someone else's rights can cause 
yes, they're definitely connected. I think it's a question of emphasis, right? And I think the idea of having both and knowing when to employ one versus knowing when to employ the other, I think matters. And I think that being able to recognize people's rights matters very much, but recognizing our own obligations because of someone else's rights, not because of our own rights, is what I'm talking about, right? Meaning that's what I'm talking about. It's getting out of the me a little bit. The obligation is getting out of the me. Yes, Sarah. So I think that's a great question. I think people in this room will answer that differently. I think some people will base the obligations on a moral intuition. Some people will base it on a moral code. I think some people will base it on the Torah. Some people will base it on the Shulchan Aruch. I think some people will base it on what they've been taught since they were young, what the consensus is with it. I think it's a great question. Meaning, when you talk about rights in a way, or when you talk about story, sometimes rights can actually feel a little bit more clear cut than obligation, right? But when you start actually asking the question of what does somebody else's rights, what does somebody else's rights mean about my obligations? That's an important question, right? All of these conversations that happen literally in the Supreme Court about this question of what does somebody else's rights mean about your obligations is dealing with precisely this issue. What I think is the more provocative question which we don't ask because we just assume that rights are the answer, or is the answer, is that question of what does it mean to be a human being? At, at base, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be redeemed? Does it mean that I have rights or does it mean that I have obligations? Obviously, it means both. But do we, when do we focus on the obligation piece? When do we get off of the me and onto the somebody else, right? And that, that's a question I wonder. And the emphasis of story, 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 story doesn't really get me off of the me. Because even looking at affinity groups is looking at an, another version of me. Because I've been there. And, it, and, and I'm wondering what, where the sort of objectivity standards um, demands, where those come into play. And I don't know the answer. But I, but I want to open it. I think it's important to open. Yes. Well, so I think it's interesting what you're pointing to because I think this could actually be a difference in obligation, right? Meaning you can try to figure out, and this is what Sarah's talking about also, you can try to figure out what your obligation is based on what somebody else is asking for, right? This is the Gemara where it talks about de machsoro, giving a person what they're missing. Do you give them everything that they want? Do you give them just what their standard is? Do you give them what the regular standard is, right? So that conversation takes place even within Judaism, right? But you're saying the idea of almost like um, obligations without looking at the other person's yeah. rights. It, it, no, obviously that has a danger. It could be just uh, authoritarian or not paying Well, so I, I, it, it, that's I, interesting. I dangerous, that's interesting. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if I would call that the difference between, like a major difference between Christianity and Judaism, just because I think there's a lot in Judaism, like Lefini Mishirat Adin, going beyond the letter of the law, where, right? And the question of, right. but, but the question of do people deserve certain things? is definitely uh, in there. The question of deservedness is definitely in Jewish law. It's interesting. Yes, Nicole. I feel like a category that you haven't mentioned is, or this question, can there be an obligation to self that's not necessarily uh, defined as right? So this is amazing because the conversation, there are a lot of great articles actually written on this question of what do rights look like in Judaism? And many of these articles come to the conclusion that rights are actually just obligations to other people, basically, because, and one of the ways that people get there 
is they say, well, actually Judaism has an obligation to preserve one's own body. And that right there is actually the moment when you realize, oh, my own rights are curtailed by my obligation to myself, right? right? And that's, right. right, in the abortion conversation, in the assisted suicide conversation, right, that, that is exactly that issue, right? Meaning those are the places where you say, oh, this is actually obligation-based, mm -hmm. and rights are part of right. obligation, but the obligation is the underlying piece. Right. Again, understanding that we probably all here understand obligation differently in a lot of different ways, and some people are using obligation in a different way than you might be using obligation, and I think that's important to recognize. Yes? So, you know, wife, daughter, sister, friend, yes. Um, Sure. So I would say the message to the congregants is to actually talk about what obligation means and what role obligation actually plays in our lives. I think we, I think we live in a society where narrative is the beginning, the end, and the middle. People love Passover particularly. Correct. The experience, my experience, is very de defining of who I am and what I think my obligations are. And I think actually asking people, and this is also a Jewish continuity question, right? This, this has a lot of different, um, this has many different echoes. When do we talk about obligation? What does obligation actually mean in our lives? And what does it do for us that the story can't do or that the rights can't do? I think that's a really important conversation to have around the Passover table. And I don't think it happens, if I'm not mistaken. It's never happened at mine. So it will this year, because I have to prepare for this. But it's never happened at mine. Other thoughts? Yeah? Well, you started off you know, looking at the Torah text and saying, you know, the 36 times we're commanded to take care of the stranger because of the rich and the land. Yeah. It seems to me that you know, it would be really interesting to text doesn't say, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, therefore, you should take care of the stranger. Well, sometimes, sometimes it does. Well, sometimes, sometimes it does. Yeah. But, you know, but people don't, people weren't out on the street and at the airport because of that. You know? Wow. Well, I mean, I think, I think that, right. that, you know, that depends. It depends. You know, and, and you know, what, what the rabbis were doing with the Haggadah, I think, you know, um, is uh, there was an urgency Yep. This is not just for now. Yep. Um, you know, and we've got to organize this this people and this structure so it can survive anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't just do it with story. They just can't sing the songs of Hamilton and be obligated, right? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing's going to force them to sing those songs mm -hmm. and then act out on them and make them into obligations. You yeah. Know, so it, it's an obligation. interesting. I, I often have this conversation with people that. Um, when people say, what do I do? My kid is not at the Seder. My kid is the fifth child who's not at the Seder. And what I say is, have you ever offered to go where they are? Right? And what's interesting to me is that that impulse of not asking to go where they are, but to think that they have to come where I am, that's also a narrative impulse. Because the assumption is, this is what Pesach looks like, and this is what it has to look like, and everybody has to be, and if they're not, they're not. Right? There's something about what you're saying in terms of what are our obligations rather than what do we want to see and what do we get to see and what do we, that, that speaks directly to that. And that's why I think the conversation has to happen. I, I think the overemphasis of narrative, I think is highly um, handcuffing in a way in terms of actually being able to, it actually being able to navigate like the real world, right? Or actually being able to feel obligated towards someone else or something else. And yes, it's beautiful. At our seders, we bring up other peoples, obviously, right? You bring up sex trafficking in America. You bring up uh, slavery for the diamond trade in, in Africa. You, br you bring up a lot of things, right? But 
the question of what is actually not because this was my story, but because there's an obligation to do something and to be a certain way, and it's not just because that's what I feel like. Are we, are, where is that? Like, where, where, what, what role is that playing? What role is that playing? And I have to tell you that in places where obligation plays a huge role within the Jewish community, the question of obligation beyond the obligation to eat the matzah and the obligation to drink the four kosod, that question of obligation is not coming up in other fields either, right? So it's not like if we looked at the Jewish people and we said to ourselves, what are the Jewish people responsible for? There will be elements of the Jewish people who will be responsible for thinking about what is my obligation vis-a-vis the world? There will be other Jews who are responsible for what is my obligation vis-a-vis God in a moral, philosophical way. There will be other people who will be what is my obligation vis-a-vis God in a halachic shulchan aruch way. The question is, how can we all somehow partake of the idea of obligation in as far as it actually impacts Jewish community and continuity It actually impacts what it means to be a person in the world who's not walking around primarily thinking about how it makes me feel and what it makes me uh, look like or where it comes from from my uh, um, personhood, but it actually sees another person's personhood. And who knows what else beyond in terms of how it actually can connect the Jewish people. Yes, Adam. Do you have a counterexample where... I mean, Pesach is the place where, for the most part, we're very narrative-focused, and the obligation yeah. part is the part that's missing. Do you have one where it's flipped? It's a good question. You have a suggestion? Um, well, it's related, but it's not, a, it's not the... So you're not bailing me out? You're not bailing me out? Yeah, I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. It's to our friends. Um, if I perish, I perish. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like we're, where we're really, the narrative forces us to think about our obligations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could argue, by the way, that that's the way that Judaism is set up. Period. Right? Meaning, the way that Judaism is set up is that the narrative experiences force, force you to think about obligations, the obligations reinforce the narrative experiences. Right? So, if you look at Yom Kippur, which was my, uh, that's, I, I, that's like, was my gut. If you, if you look at Yom Kippur, and it also depends, are you looking at liturgy, are you looking at halakha, are you looking at the chumash, are you looking at like the Mishnah and the, in Yom, like it's hard to know where you would be coming from, but you have, um, you know, that the whole avoda of the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, yes, it's very law-focused, but there's a whole narrative drama that's going on in pressing the reset button on the Beit HaMikdash, and God's relationship with the Jewish people, right? So I don't actually, I have to think about that if there's a place. I think the reason why I sort of focus so much on this in Pesach is because we go so, um, we go so strong on the narrative. We go so strong on the narrative. And and even when you're giving Divrei Torah at the Pesach Seder and you say, well, we dip this because this was our tears and this was, that's great. It's great. It's great. But what would happen if literally the question of what does it mean to be a human being? To have rights first, to have obligations first. Let's discuss it. Let's discuss it in terms of Jewish continuity. Let's discuss it in terms of morality. Let's discuss it in terms of the way we do our activism. Let's discuss it in the way we practice our Judaism. Like, what, what would happen if that conversation happened? We could just get away from all the cuteness of the story. For a minute, we get away from the cuteness of the story. We'll take one more, and then I think we have to end. Yes, sir, Jason. Hi, Jason. Hi. How does it affect you if you feel that you haven't fulfilled your obligations, and how does it affect you if you feel that your rights have not been respected? So in terms of the difference between rights and obligations in that way, when your rights have not... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I actually think what you what you did there is actually show us exactly the difference between rights and obligations, right? Exactly the difference. How do I feel when I haven't fulfilled my obligations and how do I 
feel when my rights have been impinged upon. Now, I can say personally, I feel much worse when my rights have been impinged upon than when I haven't fulfilled my obligation. I can say that totally personally and obviously. But one of the questions that I have is a flip side to you, which is what kind of achievement do you feel when you have fulfilled an obligation versus what kinds of achievements do you feel when you've gotten your inalienable rights uh, respected? Which one do we take for granted and which one seems like something that's really special on the horizon? You seem like you want to say something follow up. That, that, that's lovely, but I, I, my question Thank you very much, I'm glad. I feel like that might have not been such a compliment for real. I don't know. It's really cute. Good job. I was actually curious yeah. if you feel like you haven't fulfilled your obligations, how do you feel? How does it impact you? Me personally? You personally. Which obligations? People, God, self, family, let's country. Say, let's say that you've forgotten to clean out part of your house before Pesach. Let's say, or let's say that you've, you've let down, you've forgotten about a ritual obligation. First of all, it depends with which ritual obligation. It really does. Second of all, it depends. I'll tell you why it depends with which ritual obligation. Because you can't disconnect story and law. You simply can't. There are certain ritual obligations that I've been performing since I was four years old. And if I forget them, I'm forgetting all of that, right? Meaning that's a major identity, like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been. There are other obligations where it might be something that I only started doing two years ago. It makes a huge difference. Do you, do you feel guilt if you miss, if you do not perform your obligations? I'm not a big guilt person. I, I'm much more of a disappointment person. That, that's just me. Meaning, I, 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 I'm, and, and I think, yeah, sorry, you were going to say something. So, that was what I was asking. What do you so here's, what, here's what I would say, and um, people are dropping like flies, understandably. The, what I would say is, in order for obligation to actually be a compelling category for people, the conversation about not fulfilling obligation has to revolve around disappointment rather than guilt. So I think you just added something to the conversation whether you meant to or not. I was just getting you back. Um, I hope that this has given food for thought to people, whether it's something that you can make bite size and, and give at a Seder, I don't know. It depends on you and it depends on how you present things, but hopefully it's given, it's just given a way of thinking that's a little bit different or can be a little bit um, like poret, like it could just be like a flourishing, fresh, kind of way to think about this. So thank you so much and happy Purim. <laughs> Thanks everybody.